video is a continuation from the previous video. All right, so culture is another way that we as artists and designers can be inspired. And I, I love this, this um, influence on uh, Renzo Piano's uh, cultural center that he created in New Caledonia. He won a, a, a Pritzker Prize in architecture for this design. And the Pritzker Prize is sort of the equivalent to um, the Nobel Prize, sort of like the Nobel Prize for architects. And he uh, was very much inspired by uh, culture when he designed this center. And it's very, very clear that his intent was to be inspired by it and not just mimic it um, literally or sort of throw it in as an afterthought or design what he wanted and then try to justify it. He was very clearly inspired by culture in his work. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about culture. Whoops, if I can get over the next slide, there we go. Um, and so when we talk about culture, um, culture obviously can be personal or it can be uh, society's culture. So when we talk about a person's culture, we're talking about things like mannerisms, um, style, uh, the way they, they talk, um, colloquialisms, patois, the way they think. When we talk about society's culture, we can think in terms of images, ideas, attitudes, customs, skills, arts. And there's just many more, but these are just a few. And so when we talk about um, our culture, we talk about the things we are exposed to every day, things that shape our own personal culture as well as societal culture. And they are things that get passed along from generation to generation and like genetics, um, they can mutate in the process of being passed along so that the newer generation has a different culture than the previous generation, even though it has been taken from that culture. And we see that a lot, um, especially with patois, terminology, uh, words that we use that in younger cultures uses certain words that older cultures don't or generations don't and um, vice versa. And so sometimes there's a generation gap that gets created there. And just talking about this already start, all these ideas start forming in my head about how you could design a building based on generation gaps and how cool that could be because those could become interstitial spaces. So um, that would be interesting. Anyway, so back to this, my brain tends to do that sometimes. <laughs> um, and as all artists that, you know, we, we don't think linear, linearly, we, we, something sets off a thought that takes us somewhere else. And while to people who do think in a linear fashion, it makes no sense how we got from here to there. It makes perfect sense to us because we're in our own heads. Okay, and so back to the apple. <laughs> when I said to you all, think of an apple and how most people in our culture think of a red apple, it's because most of us are exposed to red apples. There are mostly red apples that are served to us. Um, they are mostly pictures of red apples. Apples, when they're presented to young children to, who are learning uh, the alphabet and words and writing, um, are red. And so our culture is about red apples. And red apples are more common. They're more frequent. That's why we see them more too. Um, and so um, we, we then become accustomed to what is an apple. And that is part of our culture. So artists and designers response to culture has taken many, many different forms. Buildings, film and television, video, portraiture, sculpture, social art, photography, animation, and many others. And here is an example of a building that the uh, architects, this is a ski slope. The building is in Denmark and you can, in the winter, and they get a lot of snow, in the winter you can ski down the building. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that there's a easy way to get back up or a way to get up at all. It looks like there's a door down here, the very bottom that may get you to the back up to the top. 
I'm not sure how they worked that out, <laughs> but it'd be interesting with skis. Um, or you could take a sled, I guess. Um, and I just found a typo. Ha! Fixed. <laughs> this is online, so it saves it for me. Um, and so that is a response to culture because when you live somewhere where it, it snows and winter is a huge part of your experience, it gets built into your um, architecture. This is another one. I love this. This is a brand new style of architecture in Bolivia that it has been inspired by uh, their indigenous culture. Um, but it's also been inspired by a different culture, which is a universal culture, which is transformers, transformations. And so uh, Freddy uh, Silvestri, he, that's a picture of him right there. These are his designs and he is the, the father of this new style of architecture. It's brand new. Um, the ones on the left, the four on the left are uh, residences. And then the one on the right is a restaurant. I think it's in a cruise ship. I forgot. Um, and you can see how, you know, they he blended these two different cultures together to create something brand new. And so, you know, so often, especially when you're starting out, you look at other styles to copy. But ultimately, once you have mastered the principles and elements of design, you can then break that those rules and do this. And of course, you know, there are going to be people who like it and people who hate it. But when you look at it as a style, it has very clear principles and elements that you can identify, right? For instance, if we talk about color, when we look at this, what do we see? We see very bright, saturated colors. That is indicative of that style. So when you're working in that style, you're most likely going to use those bright, saturated colors, especially greens and orange red, orangish reds and those blues, right? So this is a play off of a particular color scheme as well. Um, the Chrysler building in New York City was actually designed by the American car culture. These uh, rounded parts of the building are inspired by hubcaps. Um, there are gargoyles here that are representative of the uh, gargoyles that were on the, the car. Um, let's see what else. There were some other things too, but I have forgotten what they all are. But they, there's uh, several things here. The, oh, the, the chrome obviously is inspired by the shininess on a, on a car. And so this was just an interpretation of American car culture. Um, this is actually uh, recently um, painted and it was done before the pandemic because you, you know the people, this is a lot of people that do uh, urban art wear these respirators because the paint has very toxic fumes. And so he did this in 2019, but obviously because of the pandemic, it now has a new image and, and, and a new appearance. And so um, murals, urban art, um, which is what this is, this is graffiti because somebody painted over, tagged the mural that was there, um, can, make, can make a huge statement um, on, a, on a building. And so that be, that turns that can change the culture of a building over time because you know there are some old buildings that get renovated, and there are old warehouses that frequently get renovated into residences. And some of my personal favorites are those that incorporate urban art in the renovation because it brings the culture of that area to the people who live there that tie in the city or the town, usually city to the, the, the residents and it truly creates both a cultural, architectural, artistic sense of home by incorporating local culture and local architecture. Okay, art history. Um, I know the word history, people hear the word history and it just sometimes just generates this uh, response and I, I get it, um, a lot of history classes are, are very boring. There are a lot of uh, dates that we don't relate to um, and a lot of people we don't know and don't don't necessarily want to know. Um, but it's important. And fortunately for us, art history is usually taught visually. But the things we have to think about is we didn't get to where we are now by just appearing, popping out of nowhere. 
we got to where we are through a series of developments throughout the history of art and design. And it's really, really important to study the works of those who came before us and those who are inspired by them, even if it's just to reject their styles in pursuit of our own. You know, you don't have to embrace what they did, but you can learn from other people. And that is one of the beauties of written history is that you can learn from other people without repeating their mistakes. And that is why modern civilizations are so advanced because we didn't just, we weren't just born and had to have to reinvent the wheel. It was already there waiting for us. We just decided how we were going to apply it or how we were going to design it. And so it allows us to uh, do more artistically than we would have without this base that we've built on. So it's really, really important to honor those who came before us. Um, so yeah, why study art and design history? And it does help you recognize the relationships amongst artists and designers and their influences. And so this is kind of interesting because Glenn Brown, um, he did a series of paintings. I'm sorry, Joseph Boys did a series of paintings based on um, using portraits done by Rembrandt and modifying them. And so he couldn't have done his work if Rembrandt hadn't done his work. And, you know, obviously it's, it's subjective as to whether or not you like it. I, I respect it. It's, 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 I think it's great. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly can understand why there are people who love Rembrandt and would be offended by the fact that he did this. But um, I think he takes it to the next level and I applaud anybody who can do that. Because as I've said, you are bombarded with billions of bits of information every second of every day and your conscious brain can only pick out 50. So trying to compete in a world of billions and billions of people who are trying to have their voices heard is hard. And, you know, I posted him in this, in this slide because he caught my attention. So that's saying something, whether you like him or not, he does capture your attention. Um, and, you know, you're going to hear me say this one a lot. Your goal is never to copy another designer or artist, artist, but rather to learn from their work, be inspired by their work, appreciate their work. And here's an example. Um, the one on the right, obviously, um, is a, came from Greek, ancient Greece, was built many, many, many thousands of years ago. And it was inspired as a source of inspiration for the Lincoln Memorial. And most, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., if you've ever been there for um, any reason and you look at the architecture there, um, it is um, neoclassical, neo meaning new, classical meaning, uh, the word classics and classical in architecture and literature um, in the arts in general refers to the, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks and the Romans. But the Greeks started stuff and the Romans just copied it and modified it. And so the, the original Greek architecture was uh, temples. And it was all temples to their, their particular gods, Aphrodite, Zeus, Athena, and so forth. And when Thomas Jefferson started designing, he was the main the lead architect for the layout of Washington, D.C. Um, he thought that the architecture should become be neoclassical because he believed they should become the first temples dedicated to the sovereignty of the people. And you will see that influence. And if you haven't been there and you ever get the opportunity to go, highly encourage it. Um, DC has a lot of great architecture, both non-residential and residential. Okay, I am gonna stop this video here and we will continue in the next.